example is this uh, next session is going to uh, share some ideas from companies, nonprofits, media companies about what can be done to really raise people's consciousness about water, as well as give them very practical things they can do in their daily lives, and also give businesses an opportunity to really help amplify and engage millions of people in an effort to really change the course for water. And uh, we're going to hear about it nationally and globally, and we're also going to get a chance to dive into California and what's happening here. So um, what I'd like to do is uh, invite Sandra Postel, who is the Freshwater Fellow at National Geographic, and it is my, my, one of my life heroes. She's been writing about, thinking about, studying, talking about water um, for many years, and is just a phenomenal communicator about it. When you go on the blog of National Geographic, it is incredible to see the posts and the knowledge and information from the work followers she has. Uh, we also are joined online, Donald, can we bring uh, Christian Yang up um, from Purchase Media, who's going to be joining us to talk about what's happening with um, Change the Course, which is a consumer-focused, individual-focused campaign to create change. And, uh, and then Todd Riggs is going to be talking about what's actually happening, what's going on with water systems, and particularly the Colorado River, because of that effort. And, uh, and we'll take some questions, and then we're going to ask Bob Wilkinson, a uh, professor here from UC Santa Barbara, who knows more about water and energy in California than just about anybody else. Um, and he's going to share with us his perspectives about what's going on and what it means for business. And again, what's the headset we want to be wearing as business, executives, decision makers, as we think about what we can do about water. So with that, Sam, I'm going to give you the clicker, and I'm going to give you Thank you. That, and you are ready to go. Okay, and this little green light means this is on. Right? And that goes forward, so just keep your finger up here. Okay, okay. All right, thank you. Well, it's great to be here um, to talk about water, which is my favorite topic. i um, working on it for a very long time, and I'm very excited about uh, this opportunity to share what we're doing um, with you today. Um, you know, I think all we have to do is pick up the newspaper, um, digital, whatever, um, look outside here in California to realize that um, you know, the human story over the next several decades is going to be, a, to a large degree, a water story. Um, and as I think as we've been hearing about this morning, um, you know, the narrative of that story is being written every day by the choices we make about how we use water, how we manage water, um, how we think about water, um, and how we value water. And so what I'd like to do this morning is, um, um, what I'd like to do this morning is talk a little bit about the global water predicament that we're in, um, and then <coughs> about a campaign uh, that National Geographic and the Bonneville Environmental Foundation and participant media with Christian on the line um, have partnered up to orchestrate to directly address this global challenge. Um, and so I'm going to hopefully do that in about 11 minutes and then pass off to Todd and, and Christian. <coughs> Now, we're very lucky um, to live on a very water-wealthy planet, of course, but the vast majority of Earth's water is salt water. Only 2.5% is fresh, and two-thirds of that is locked up in glaciers and ice caps. So less than 1% of all the water on the planet is fresh and liquid and somewhat accessible to us to use. So it's a very tiny share, and yet our population and consumer demands for water are continuing to grow against that small and finite share of water. Um, as we've been hearing this morning, it takes um, a lot of water to make all the things that we use and wear and buy and eat um, every day, and sometimes a surprising amount of water. The typical cotton shirt, not a sustainable Patagonia shirt, but the typical cotton shirt, right, takes about 700 gallons of water to make. And most of that is to grow the cotton out in the field. Um, so that's a lot of water just in this room when you think about our attire for today. Um, typical hamburger. This is, again, not the sustainable grass-fed, grass-finished hamburger, but the typical hamburger, surprising amount of water, 634 gallons of water. That's about a week's worth of water used at home by the average American in one hamburger typical hamburger, so it's a lot of water. And then we multiply all of those gallons for our everyday food consumption, everyday uh, material purchases, 
by billions of people, billions of meals, billions of purchases, um, and we begin to understand why we're in the predicament that we're in, um, why every year we're getting a water stress map you know, globally that's um, getting redder and redder and redder with, with every passing year. If you look at this map, you'll see focus on the red zones, and what's happening is, you know, demands are basically bumping up against the limits of that finite water supply, right? And what you see happening in, of course, the Western US, North Africa, so much of Asia, is that you see really two big things happening. Groundwater is being depleted. We're over pumping groundwater. And rivers are running dry, that we're running out of that renewable water supply. Um, even though it's renewable, it is finite, so we can overuse it um, in a time frame of a year. And so we get images like this, the dry Rio Grande in New Mexico. Um, we get the dry Murray in Australia. And we get, of course, the dry Colorado, um, the lifeline of the American <coughs> Southwest. So these are big, big challenges. And so if we're going to have any hope for this sustainable water future, right? We've got to figure out some way to change this course. We can't really stay on this course as it's going. And that's exactly what our Change the Course campaign is designed to do. Um, we're just, we're, we're um, planning on addressing very directly um, the two big challenges that we face um, as a global society, and that is shrinking this human water footprint and then restoring billions of gallons of water back to depleted ecosystems. And so we're starting that movement with this Change the Course campaign. Oh, up here, sorry. Um, and so we're piloting it in the Colorado River Basin. I say it's Change the Course. Um, we're piloting it in the Colorado River Basin. Um, as all of you know, extremely iconic uh, river basin, sculpted the Grand Canyon, uh, 30 million people, now depend on the Colorado River um, to some degree. Uh, five million acres of irrigated land depend on the Colorado River. So incredibly important, incredibly iconic, but it is heavily stressed and very badly in need of, of restoration. So as you can see, we've got five key elements um, to change the course. We want to engage the public um, in a very direct way. So through um, our online media channels through our online websites, through social media, which we're going to hear more about. We invite the public in to get educated about what's happening with, with the Global Water Challenge, um, and most importantly, what their individual participation in that challenge is. What is their individual water footprint? So we've provided, uh, for example, at National Geographic, we built a fairly <coughs> comprehensive water calculator that allows you to go in and ask questions about you know, your diet and your purchases and your everyday use of water at home and your energy use and tie it all back to your water use. And if you do that as an average, average American, 2,000 gallons of water a day to keep our average American lifestyle flowing <coughs> for one day. So you can go online and learn about it. Learn some tips about how you can conserve and get, and get engaged. We invite people in to pledge. And this is not a pledge of money. It's a pledge to do something, right, in your daily life to shrink your personal water footprint, to conserve water in some way. And we promise for every pledge that's made, again, not, this is not a pledge of money, we're promising as, as change the course, for every personal pledge that's made to return 1,000 gallons of water to a depleted part of the Colorado River Basin. And what makes that work are corporate sponsors that also wish to balance out their water footprint by returning water to a part of the environment that needs it. And so it's, in a sense, the corporate sponsorships underwrite the pledges and provide the funding for the restoration work on the ground. And what Change the Course does then is bring together consumers, corporations, and conservation groups on the ground to do this kind of expanding cycle of educate, conserve, restore, educate, conserve, restore, and it expands from there. And so this is, this is really a key part of it. We have, um, you know, I'm grateful, hap we're happy to say we've already got about a half dozen uh, corporate sponsors for Change the Course, including 1% um, for the Planet Partners. So we're off to a great start, of course, always wanting to build more. And this is really about a movement of change. It's really about reinforcing this cycle and saying a good, good corporate stewardship is about 
giving back and beginning to mainstream that idea. And without that, we don't really have any chance, right, of changing the course sufficiently. And then, of course, we do the restoration work. We work with conservation groups on the ground, and Todd's going to talk a little bit more about this later. Um, we work with conservation groups on the ground to do the work of, of restoration and making sure, this is very important, that all of these projects have high ecological value, good ecological bang for the buck. Um, and this is, this is extremely important to us. And then we share the stories. We want to build this movement, so we share. So we use the National Geographic's website. We use our, our media channels through our changethecourse.us uh, website and social media work um, to tell the stories of what we're accomplishing on the ground. Um, and so this, this too is very important for people to understand what their pledge is doing and getting them involved in actually understanding the restoration work that we're accomplishing. So we're, as I say, we're piloting this campaign in the Colorado River Basin with every intention that it moves out to other river basins nationally and beyond in the world. Um, I think we already have proof of concept the Colorado River Basin is so large that we're, we're actually continuing to do some really exciting work um, in, in the Colorado River Basin. The, as you can see here, our um, projects so far, which you can see in orange, um, really span the whole basin from beautiful headwater tributaries, um, the Yampa River, the, the Fraser River, the, the Roaring Fork River in, in Aspen, um, uh, beautiful headwater tributaries that very often are depleted for sometimes miles at a stretch in the dry summer months when there's extensive irrigation done. Through the, the central desert areas, including the Verde River in Arizona, and on down to the Colorado Delta. So we're spanning, we've already had work going on pretty much throughout the basin. Um, and just to give you an idea of what these projects are, and, and overall, what we're interested in show, showing can be done is the restoration of a river in a way that also benefits the local economy. Right? You don't want to be taking away from farmers, from businesses, from in order to do the restoration work. You want to make sure that you're actually able to do the restoration of, of flow to the river, make it healthier, while also benefiting the businesses and, and local economy. And so those are the projects we're really most excited about. And in the Yamper, for example, um, if you remember, in the summer of 2012, the Colorado Basin was in an incredible drought period. Um, the Yampa River went to about 5% of its normal flow for that time of year um, in late June. And so, change the course. The Yampa, as you probably know, goes through uh, Steamboat Springs, on down through Dinosaur National Monument, joins the Green, then joins the Colorado, beautiful tributary river. Um, but it was really suffering during this drought, flowing at 5% of, of its normal flow. The native whitefish population was at risk of crashing. Um, the tubing businesses had shut down. Fly fishing businesses had shut down. And so we partnered up with the Colorado Water Trust um, to execute a water lease, to fund and execute a water lease that allowed the river to come back up to a healthier level during, during that dry period. Um, and so the tubing businesses reopened, fly fishing reopened, the native whitefish population did not crash. And so it kind of showed that <clears throat> rivers don't have to be last in line during a time of drought. They don't have to be the last to get water and stay healthy during a time of drought. And it benefited everybody in the valley. Um, so it was, as far as we could tell, you know, a win-win-win all around, and a good example of that. Um, the Delta is a much more complicated story, um, and it's going to be an ongoing one. You're going to hear a lot about it this spring. Um, because the United States and Mexico, much to many of our amazements, um, signed an agreement in late 2012 that commits the two countries to provide some flow back to the Delta. As most of you know, Colorado has not been reaching the sea for most years, for half a century. Um, as a result of an amendment to the treaty on the Colorado between Mexico and the United States, there's going to be a pulse flow this spring that sends water back down through the delta and continues providing a base flow and restoration of the wetlands and change the course is playing a small part in that as well. Um, the, the key thing here is how do you get the water for this? And the institutional tool there is a, a, excuse me, a water bank um, that allows farmers in the Delta that would like to sell their water rights, that it's totally voluntary, that would like to, to be captured in this water bank, and then that water is used to do the work of restoration of riparian areas, of wetlands, and to bring, you know, the, the Delta, as you I'm sure know, used to be 
this enormously beautiful, lush, two million acres of, of bird habitat and incredible wildlife. It's now a desiccated place, as you saw in the last slide. Nothing like its former self. But if you add water, we've seen this in the Delta, it bounces back, it comes back. We will see a difference from this blood pulse in the spring um, and the continuing work of restoration. So this is a very exciting project to us. And again, we're playing a small part in investing in the water bank to do this purchase of rights and, and returning the flow. The Verde River had, is one I hadn't known very well until I went there. It's a beautiful desert river, but again, depleted for miles during that irrigation season because of the ex excessive diversion of water for agriculture. Um, but again, it's because the ag agriculture is often being done the way it was 150 years ago. And so we supported in Verde an upgrade of the irrigation system. We put in, helped put in automated head gates um, that allowed the farmers and others that were irrigating to take the water they needed but leave more for the river by a solar powered automation system that allows the water level to stay at a certain point. Everybody gets what they need but the rest goes to the river. So this is a picture of the head gate here with the ditch boss, um, Frank Vermenden. <laughs> um, he used to have to run out in the middle of the night and lift this gate you know, manually and let the water through and so on. It's what made things easier on him. But the water on the right is going into the ditch system. The water on the left is flowing back to the river. So it no longer needs to go dry in, that, in those summer months. And again, a beautiful tributary river, beautiful desert river with uh, native fish and incredible wildlife. Um, so this is, has high ecological value. So, so these are the kind of projects that we want to do. Um, and it shows that we can, in fact, you know, meet human needs, have healthy economies, um, but do this important work of restoration for the, for the river, for the biodiversity, for everything that, you know, that depends on it. Um, I'm going to stop there and turn things to Todd for a while and you're going to take your questions after you do uh, the whole presentation. So, um, but I just want to conclude with the, with the point that um, what we're most interested in here is, is the restoration of this, but really this, I think someone, maybe it was you, Rebecca, using this, it, raising consciousness about water. This public education and engagement really is a consciousness raising effort. When we think about water when we turn on the tap and that's about it, but in fact it's everywhere in this room. It's hiding in everything that's in this room. And that consciousness is really important and getting people engaged and being able to have this kind of virtual cycle of education conservation, restoration, and just expand it out and build this movement as well. So Todd, thank you. Thanks, Sandra. It's an incredible honor to be here with all of you, um, in large part because I know the room is filled with like-minded individuals and companies that are trying to work proactively to touch on all these critical points. And one of the things that's most exciting for us around this campaign is typically um, this type of environmental work focuses on one piece of the puzzle. You know, we work on advocacy, we work on education, or we work on environmental projects. And for the first time, or, or certainly in a very new way, this collaboration among, frankly, very different partners from a, a media company to National Geographic to BDF is bringing together the tools and the ideas to try and see if there's a pilot approacher that can scale this impact, can really bring all of those pieces together. So it's amazing for me um, and the Bonneville Environmental Foundation to be a part of it, but also to share with the folks in the room and the folks online, because you guys are the types of companies that are thinking out of the box about how do you engage your customers, your stakeholders, etc., and how do you use your products and your work in a way to achieve these impacts. So it's fantastic to be here, thank you. Um, I want to start out talking a little bit about the projects and the notion of what we call a water restoration certificate. When we began working in the watershed space in the West, it quickly became apparent to us that there are tens of thousands of miles of these critically dewatered streams, rivers, wetlands. Um, and it's very challenging to get water back into these systems. The legal framework is not always super conducive to achieving this. Um, the social framework is certainly not always conducive. And the tools are often very tricky to deal with. But over time, especially over the last decade, society's made a lot of progress in showcasing new ideas and new approaches to balance water um, needs for humans and for the environment. And as we worked with our corporate partners, as we worked with our NGO on the ground partners, we saw this increasing pressure around water and we wanted to develop an idea that could achieve collective impact, could allow a bookshop with two employees and a company with 10,000 employees ultimately to combine their resources and begin balancing their own water use impacts, balancing their own water footprint 
with restoration of water to a dewatered ecosystem. So we come up with this idea of a water restoration certificate. In its most simple sense, it's simply um, a currency or an accounting framework. One water restoration certificate is equal to a thousand gallons of water restored to a critically dewatered ecosystem. And so as we use the framework of a water restoration certificate as a reporting vehicle, in concert with our corporate partners around Change the Course, in concert with other partners that we have, and working with projects on the ground, we're able to hopefully connect myriad companies, individuals, small and large, um, to create the collective power to be able to invest in these projects that can balance this human water use footprint um, and can continue to, to serve ecological recreation needs um, at the same time as they can benefit ecosystem needs. And so the, I, I implore you to keep in mind this notion of the water restoration certificate as a new idea and as a crux element of the Change the Course campaign of bringing corporations in, allowing them to sort of report on their sustainability metrics around water, um, and at the same time benefiting ecosystems and the environment. Um, so jump to the really exciting, for me at least, the map over there. Um, the Colorado Basin is not necessarily a place where this kind of innovative practice has been immensely successful. Um, but a year into it with change, of course you can see on the map, as, as Sandra indicated, working from headwaters to the delta with a range of partners, a range of projects that are actually putting water back in the stream. And in most cases are also providing benefits to these irrigators, making it easier for them, providing infrastructure, providing incentives to use water in a smarter way. Tremendously exciting for us to be a part of that. On the Verde, a quick example, um, that's, a, that's a river that actually provides surface water for Phoenix metro area. Lots of companies use a lot of water operating out of Phoenix, um, and they're very nervous about this. And so the ability for them to work with us to restore water to an Arizona environment and to, to be aware of the fact that they're contributing to balancing water use for the environment and for their needs is very powerful. I just have a couple of minutes left. I want to talk about the corporate sponsor engagement side. We are attempting, we're learning every day, we're adapting every day, but we're attempting to work with every type of partner that's out there. A big company that has a ton of money, a tiny company that's passionate about the environment. We are creating tools and assets to try and provide value to these corporate partners, whether it's tools that engage their employees, tools that engage their customers, tools that engage their supply chain, can help create this movement, can help empower companies to showcase their leadership in this water stewardship arena and provide engagement platforms that can help them bring more of their partners on board. And so we're really attempting to engage a wide range of companies, even into the university sector. We even are signing contracts with the first pro sports league and pro sports team that will have a fan engagement component around change of course, working with big companies that are attempting to engage thousands of their employees, working with modest sized companies that want to influence their supply chain. So really working with National Geographic and participant media, as you'll hear from Christian, to create innovative tools and assets to try and scale this effort and build it into the movement that we think it can be. Um, so appreciate the opportunity. And I'm going to pass it over to Christian and the incredible work that, that he's doing at Participant Media to help build this out and create a successor. And just to give you one perspective about Christian, he wasn't able to join us today because he was ill, but I want you to know that even ill, Christian is a rock star. He fills stadiums. Literally, he had 18,000 screaming teenagers who learned about Change the Course and who were texting and pledging and doing what they could in arenas in Seattle. He was just in Minneapolis, I believe. And so um, we just, we appreciate the, uh, the power of being able to reach people. And Christian is one of the best in the business on this. So, Christian. Well, that, that is far too kind. And uh, I really appreciate the introduction. I'm sorry that I can't be there with you all in Santa Barbara. Um, but nonetheless, I didn't want to get the entire room sick. I'll just, I'll settle for just getting our office sick. <laughs> uh, but a little bit about uh, participant media um, as a background, if you're not familiar with the company, but we were founded by Jeff Skoll, one of the co-founders of eBay, about 10 years ago as a entertainment company, specifically making films. And Jeff wanted to believe that he could make films that could inspire and accelerate social change. And frankly, after 47 films, I think he's proven that we've been able to do that. Now, we're not just a film company anymore. We're over 200 employees in cities all around the U.S. Um, aside from the films that we do, we also have a web presence with TakePart.com, which has about 7 million unique visitors a month. And actually, last August, we just launched our cable network, Pivot TV, which has also been hosting a lot of Change the Course content as well. 
But really, um, as, as Todd and Sandra have outlined, our goal would change the course, um, specifically participants' role, has been that education and inspiration. Um, using the storytelling techniques that is our specialty, and using the guidance of the experts at Bonneville and National Geographic Society to really educate the Change the Course community and our Change the Course partners, and, and that's what we call them. It's not just a list, it's really it's our partners, those folks who have taken the pledge and want to take it that one step further. So what we do, we, we create content. We did a series of PSAs called Life Without Water is Awkward that have been running on Pivot in 43 million homes around America, and also have been running on Nat Geo Wild and even more houses around America. Um, we do 30 second stops. We do installations with some of our partners. Silk did an extraordinary uh, installation in Chicago around the Colorado. Um, and, and with our sponsors, which I think we just sort of um, you know, scratched really the, the tip of the iceberg of what we're going to do in the activation, particularly that the Bonneville Environmental Foundation and the NGS is enchanting. Um, and then social media as well, which, which Sandra mentioned. Um, we have a strong presence there, not only with the Change of Course community, which is about 22,000 strong. Um, but also with the other communities that we activate with take part, um, with relevant communities that we have and have fostered through other films like Food Inc., um, which is an active community of about almost 900,000 strong. Um, so things are going very strong uh, in that direction as well. So as I mentioned before, we don't look at this as building an email list or a mobile list because those are the two ways you can take the pledge. You can sign up on changesupports.us or you can text the word river to 77177. But we don't look at it as just building lists and collecting pledges. Instead, what we're committed to is building sustainable communities that we can converse with and celebrate with for years to come. So we're not just talking at a community or talking at email addresses, but instead we're trying to have a two-way conversation. And that's something that we're actually starting to um, uh, take a lead on right now, with, which Sandra has, has brought to the team, uh, which is hearing back from our pledge community. We hear back to them from SMS, we hear back to them from a social media standpoint, but we want to hear what's working and what isn't working. So if someone says, hey, we still really need more education about my lawn. How much water does that take? And if we start seeing that conversation coming up, that question coming up, we address it in our next email. We address it in our next SMS list. But really, before uh, we go into this campaign and architect it and start shaping it with our partners at Bonneville and, and NGS, we did an audience review before we started architecting the campaign to find out what stops people from taking action. You know, there's social action campaigns all over the place where we're trying to get people to take action. What's the best way that we can do it? And really, we found three things. One, people felt overwhelmed. They didn't know where to start when it came to social causes. So we needed to make this issue in and around the Colorado Basin very clear, and we needed to make this innovative solution that was presented to the audience even clearer. The second one was not enough time. So we realized that when we formulated this campaign, it had to be quick. We weren't going to be wasting more time. We were going to tell you about the problem, the solution, the next step, and the role that you play as a consumer. And then that third one, which is really most important to us from an inside perspective, is we found that people didn't feel like their action really made any difference. Great, I signed the petition. Great, I signed the pledge. I don't feel like it really made a difference. And this is what we need to do to not only show them that they can make a difference, but to also reinforce and communicate and celebrate with that community when they did, which Sandra has done such a great job of outlining the successes so far with the campaign. We relay those messages back to the Change the Course community. And again, through the email communication, through social media communication, and through our SMS list as well. So just a few stats on the campaign, we'll just do a, a, a quick little dive on the data of the campaign. So since soft launching in about February, March of last year, um, we've had 40,469 pledges so far. These are folks who have taken the pledge to conserve in their daily lives um, and also joined with the Change the Course campaign. Uh, total, total campaign video views, we're up to almost 120,000 campaign video views. And really, the challenge, another challenge that we faced was, before we launched the campaign, we thought, will anyone outside of the seven state Colorado Basin really care about this campaign? Will they really care about the Colorado River and all of its tributaries? And very quickly, we found out that yes, indeed, they do. Uh, and we have the data to show for it. We've had numerous pledges from all 50 states, and actually, due to the unbelievable global reach of our friends at National Geographic, We've had pledges from over 113 different countries and territories. And not only that, we've had visits from over 222 countries and territories. We're really, we're waiting on North Korea, but the internet doesn't seem to be working over there. That's one of four countries that have not visited to change the course site, North Korea, the Central African Republic, and a few countries that I particularly cannot pronounce. Uh, that being said, uh, on Facebook, as I mentioned before, 
Those are supposed to be some dog, not me, I promise. Uh, Facebook fans, 21,000 Facebook fans, and just in the first half of this month of February, we've had close to 600 mentions on Twitter. But really, you know, as we see it, social media is not an end in itself, but really we see it as a new channel through which we can trade in this currency of human emotion. And this is something that we want to continue to share and reinforce with the community. Uh, because to deeply engage with this audience and to inspire them to share the message, which is so crucial, and that's really where social media really pays off, we know that to position ourselves in this campaign, we position ourselves as educators, but also as a chief celebrant rather than as the celebrity of the community. We want to celebrate and continue to reinforce the action that folks are taking on the ground in their daily lives, because then we can maximize and highlight the effect that that is taking in the Colorado Basin area and beyond. And I'll wrap it there and concede my time. <laughs> Thank you so very much. I think what is amazing about this campaign, and 1% for the Planet is really thrilled to be uh, a partner with uh, the Change the Course campaign. And we are working to bring together our whole group of companies, which make small contributions and add them up. And we're going to hear more about that uh, later today with one of our companies making the anchor pledge to be uh, our, our lead company in the 1% community. And, um, What's interesting is when you start aggregating people, what our community in 1% represents about just a little under $3 billion of global sales. With this meeting, we are adding to our community, the companies represented in this meeting, uh, bring us up to about $40 billion uh, in global sales. And when you start thinking about how many employees is that, when we look across our community and their community, it ends up being about 45,000 employees. So we just start thinking about what if every one of those employees texted River and said, I want to do this. And what if everybody looked at contributing what they can based on their company and their size to really make this go, wow, we could start making this happen. And I was thinking about the valuation of Bitcoin. So Bitcoin is a currency that's been made up, like all currencies, but it's been made up and it now has value and it's being traded. And I was thinking about water certificates. Could they be the next new Bitcoin, but with reality and accountability <laughs> attached to it? And transparency. And what's interesting to me is thinking about, could we create a whole new market for um, support and exchange in water? And I think that starts to be incredibly exciting. So what we're gonna do right now is just take um, a couple of questions from the online and in audience uh, community here. So questions about change the course. Mmm, a lot of digestion. Mm -hmm. Let's see. I'll start with one. Okay. What's the website? We've got some outstanding material on this map and so forth. Where do people go to get that? Um, I'm not sure if the map is on the website, but um, a couple of different websites. The most important one is changethecourse.us, uh, which is the sort of the hub for change, the hub for change the course. Is it on? Um, it is. It is. Just hold it close. Okay. You can't hear it here. Um, and then uh, each organization has individual websites as well. So at National Geographic, it's on our Freshwater Hub. We have a Change the Course Hub under our Freshwater um, platform at National Geographic. Um, Bonneville also has um, a dedicated website. So, so there's the main one, and then each organization has one. So there's lots of information there. Um, Water Currents, as Rebecca kindly mentioned, is our um, freshwater blog platform, and so all of our, we do videos of, of our main projects, stories of, of our main projects, those are all available online. Um, so there's quite, there's quite a rich content, the water calculator is online, um, so it's a lot of, a lot of materials there. And, okay, good. Um, let's ask a question back here from someone who hasn't been heard from, and then, yes, uh, and then we'll come back around. Uh, <coughs> Uh, this is more a question just so when we leave the room today and maybe we're not going to go online and calculate our water use today but if you had to name the top say like three things that you can do individually um, to make the greatest reduction in your water your personal water use what would those things be well in terms of the uh, in terms of the personal water footprint diet is far and away the most uh, important part. So if you really want to do one thing to shrink your personal water footprint, it really is thinking with some consciousness about your diet. Um, I eat meat, I eat certain kinds of meat and try to avoid others, so it's not like I'm, you know, you have to go the whole hundred yards, but if everyone did a bit in their diet, that could make a, a huge difference globally. Multiply that by billions of people. 
So I would think diet is, is very, very important. Um, uh, and the second biggest part of our footprint is energy. Um, it takes a lot of water to make the energy. Every gallon of gas is 13 gallons of water. And so just that consciousness that every time we conserve energy, we're conserving water. So that's a really great way of dealing with our climate impact, our energy impact, and our water impact all at the same time. And I think once you see those connections, you can start to go, oh, I'm going to connect those up, I'm going to make a change, and voila, well, I'll start changing the course. That's good. One more question. There was a question over here. Um, my question is related to partnerships with other local nonprofits. Um, so I represent an eco-education organization down in South California, and we also collect pledges around various ecosystems, individual actions that can be taken, and it would be really wonderful to collaborate and harness those pledges and harness those actions to redirect people to change the course. Your education is amazing, and we just love to formalize you know, if, if there are ways that you can collaborate. And that's definitely our ambition um, across sort of the NGO platform is both to sort of leverage other assets that NGOs provide and provide our set of assets to, to provide relevance to your constituents and your stakeholders. And also with the NGOs we partner with who are actually implementing projects. And if we're going to be successful, it is going to require that sort of strategic alignment to grow this into a movement. And so that is very much something we're exploring with a range of NGOs and partners right now would love to explore with you and figure out just how to leverage these assets. We've built what we think is a very compelling foundation, um, and so it's going to require partnerships to take advantage of that and, and to move it into the space where we know it can be successful. And Kristen, do you want to talk for a minute just about Take Part and the, um, I'm going to borrow your, do you want to? Uh, talk just a minute about take part in the community of nonprofits that you highlight around different issues, uh, water and others, because uh, I think that speaks directly to this. Yeah, absolutely. So on takepart.com, uh, every piece of content that exists, I think they do about 35 to 37 pieces of original content a day. Um, every piece of content has some sort of action embedded into it. So if you're reading something about the polar ice caps, ideally there's going to be an action for you to take uh, related to an NGO working on the ground in that space. Um, we actually have what's called our social action network, uh, where we're able to bring on groups who want to participate in those actions, who actually supply takepart.com and actually our digital social action team uh, with those actions. And with each one of those embedded actions in the article, um, there's a checkbox check box for that group, so that they can receive all the emails that the, uh, the people signing the pledge or the petition or whatever that might be, the awareness action, uh, want to get involved and want to receive those emails. And again, as I mentioned before, continue the conversation. Um, that's available as well. Takepart.com covers a myriad of topics. Um, some of them are related to participant films and um, are ecologically related in that way. We did an inconvenient truth. We did fooding. We did the co. So those communities have continued to grow and grow over the years. Um, and that's something that we want to continue to foster with Change the Course as well. Um, building this into a community that is not only sustainable, but that continues to grow and we continue to message with content. And we cross message as well with National Geographic content. Um, they released an extraordinary piece uh, about a week ago called the American Nile, and we're actually going to be messaging out to the Change the Course community about that uh, this week and then in our, our following bi-weekly email. Great. And if you have any interest about getting involved in the social action network at takepart.com, please feel free to reach out to myself, and uh, we can make that happen. Okay, perfect. Okay, um, we're now going to switch gears, and kind of we've been thinking about river systems and a big swath of the American West. Um, that people all around the globe care about. And now we're going to hear a little bit about what's going on here in California. And so, uh, I'm going to give you this. This is Bob Wilkinson, um, again, leading authority on energy and water in California and also around the globe. So, happy to have him here. And uh, you just need to read up. Good. I'm going to pick up the theme a little bit on, um, on water and energy and climate. Uh, I want to pick up to a, kind of a high level first and talk about how we're thinking about these issues. Uh, and then bring it down to some of the specific actions. The 19 and 33 are two numbers that are quite interesting. We developed an analysis here in California, and through the California Energy Commission, figured out that 19% of our electricity is related to water. That is much, much bigger than most people have realized. That's all the different steps in the water process, which I won't take time to go through right now, but in total. And about a third of the non-power plant natural gas. The good news is, that improving water use efficiency saves huge amounts of energy, which in turn saves huge amounts of greenhouse gas emissions. 
So the win on this is that a lot of the efforts that many of you were involved in, or might want to get more involved in, actually have multiple benefits, and those are quantifiable benefits. Uh, it's like Bonneville, who I've been working with for many years, can actually help you translate that into practice. So, this is uh, two quick slides here of how we thought about water uh, basically a half century ago, in the lifetime of some of the folks I work with, just about into mine. This is North America, you can't read it so well at this scale, but the top of that is the water collection region, and the bottom part of that is where we put <coughs> that water. And this is the actual plumbing plan to replumb North America. Serious plan. Part of our systems here in California are pieces of that plan, including the state water project. The idea 50 years ago was supply side. The environmental implications were not particularly of concern. And by the way, it takes a huge amount of energy to pump water all over North America like that. Where are we going to get it? Well, <coughs> nuclear was going to be too cheap to meter. And that wasn't a joke. That was a serious understanding of limiting factors, of constraints. If you don't have environmental constraints and energy is very cheap, you could think about doing something like that in, in some kind of a rational way. It didn't work out that way. We shut down San Onofre. I've actually facilitated now three meetings this last year for the governor on what to do about the fact that San Onofre is permanently offline. This is a big shift. This is a very different world than we had thought we would be in 50 years ago. So a lot of what we're talking about is, is thinking differently about systems. The mountains in that picture are really um, what Sandra's talking about in terms of the Colorado Basin. Those are data mountains, that's extraction. All the little mountains on the right are power mountains. Energy is the biggest user of water in the United States in terms of extraction from systems. On the left, most of that is irrigated agriculture. About 90% of the water in the, in the west, the Colorado Basin, about 80% here in California of the water is used for agriculture. So this is an advisor to several Republican presidents, and I think it's, it's worth the things that can't go on forever don't. Uh, and so what are we going to do instead? And so I have two bar charts for you. And uh, the point of this is, uh, there's no quiz on this, it's simple. Um, the far left is, this is energy intensity of water. How much energy does it take to get the water that we use? The important point is on the far left is efficiency. It's down at zero. Some have argued it should be a negative number, but let's leave it at zero. That is, if you fix the leaks, change the toilets, change the landscapes, do all the things that we're going to be under a lot of uh, uh, pressure and advice here uh, in the next month or so for California drought. Obama's flying in tomorrow to Fresno with our two senators, and there's going to be quite a circus. But it's really all going to be about how do we do more with less and deal with, with short water. My take is even when we bounce back into the West, all these same things are going to be appropriate and necessary to do for all the right reasons. You then go to groundwater, even contaminated groundwater with treatment, with reverse osmosis, with recycled water, and compare that to the red bars, which are the so-called conventional systems, moving water around uh, through conveyance systems, pumping it around, and then the estimates for ocean desalination. And the point of all that is simply this, that using water more efficiently, capturing and recharging groundwater through strategies that, uh, that use the natural uh, system in place and recycling water save a huge amount of energy and therefore emissions relative to what we would do otherwise throwing away and trying to import more. My last slide is the official California water plan now and we've gone through a couple cycles and the take home on this is the biggest new water supply for California for the next few decades is going to be urban water use efficiency. So in addition to Sanders answer on, on the diet and so forth changing out toilets. They used to use five to 10 gallons of flush when I was a kid. We got real efficient to three and a half, then the ultra low flow of one and a half, which is the current federal standard signed by George Bush in the Energy Act, by the way, 20 years ago. Now you can get 0 0.8 gallon per flush toilets that really work well. They work better than the other ones. I just put one in to test it out. So there's a lot we can do, and that's a huge amount of the water we use in urban systems, the landscape and all the rest. And by doing that, less water uh, taken out of natural systems, more that go into the kind of credits uh, that we're talking about, more that would reduce energy use and, and emissions. So that's my little quick wrap on this. Um, a couple of takeaway points here. I think integrated strategies. Thinking about multiple benefits against uh, a particular cost. The ROI taking into account 
all of those benefits that you're getting, including potentially stacking credits. So this is an interesting topic for us to talk about with one of them. If you're doing something like a climate credit or for the right reasons for energy or water, what are the opportunities to think about integrating and stacking credits for some of that sort of thing? The other thing I just want to, a little important thank you. Part of what got me into this whole thing on the, I was doing a lot of energy work, uh, got me into water was a small grant from Patagonia. I don't know if it was 1% or it was just one of the things that Juan decided to do, but it helped me set up a class to get students out in the field to learn about water. That has led now to programs at the undergraduate and graduate program here. And a lot of people are out working in all of those fields, NGOs, government agencies, and the rest. So thank you for a little grant, but a little bit can go a long way when you're strategic about how you're investing your, your funds, and it's appreciated. It is. I think that's it. Okay, thank you very much. food in a moment and um, you know it's just really interesting then thinking about if you can find ways to change one part whether it's the way that you're managing your operations and reducing water can you have an energy benefit um, if you're thinking about changing your uh, energy use you might also be able to capture a water benefit it's starting to think about like what is the total reduction in our impact that we're actually getting and from a financial point of view I think what's very very interesting is we're starting to see the emergence of essentially new kinds of currencies Credits that can be traded on the market for carbon. Credits that can be traded on the market, they existed for a long time, but for water. Um, and the same thing with, I, I think we're going to see that with all kinds of uh, uh, new changes to the, to the food and water and energy system we have here. And so um, just it's a great way to start putting on the lens and saying, where can we do multiple things at once? Um, the ROI really goes up. Um, I think the other thing is that no matter what, we need to be more efficient, we need to capture more water, and we need to think about where that water is. And I think the idea of urban water harvesting and, and really looking at urban efficiencies is really key, particularly as we have more and more and more of our people and more and more of our companies locating in and relocating in urban areas. So, great. Well, let's open it up. We have time for, um, for questions here uh, before we start. Yeah. Hi, thanks for all the great information. Um, I have two questions. One is related to snowpack and, um, and just to get a quick opinion on that. And then the second one regarding urban um, water consumption would be um, in regards to landscape gray water systems. We have less snowpack. I just drove over Donner Pass two days ago and it was pouring rain. Get some snow. Put that yeah. Long story, that basically warmer conditions, even if precip holds the same, will have less snowpack. We may have the same amount of water, but if it comes as, as liquid, it's going to come down faster. That's not certain that we could end up with an increase in precip and snowpack, but we could get some pattern shifts, so it's a little complicated. Uh, gray water. We were the first county in the country to legalize gray water here in Santa Barbara. Uh, I did a little experiment and we had a system in my house and they, and they, they uh, wrote it up in Sunset Magazine and I cut all our heads off and all the pictures <laughs> to protect us so we wouldn't get sued. <laughs> and they wouldn't run the article for a year and the lawyers finally let them run it. Of course, it was fine. But Santa Barbara actually has a long history of, uh, goes back to the earlier grounds, of uh, trying to be sensible and rational and we've moved along on that. It's very good work on that. So there's, uh, there's a lot of potential to recycle water appropriately and safely for plants. Of course, it does help if you have less salt in whatever water you're using. So water softener is a bad idea if you're trying to use it in your garden and even some of the flocking agents <coughs> some products. So, I think we'll probably start with the answer here with the drought. We're interested in that. And groups, Community Environmental Council and others have been helping people for years on how do you do this stuff right. Information <coughs> seems to me that the um, sacred cow of the human population and the, the environmental movement as well is uh, the size of the human population. And so my question is, you know, when and how are, are we going to kind of get on the same page and, and be able to meaningfully bring that to the table? It strikes me that, you know, if you look at the uh, water use, it could be the most uh, 
effective water saving device could be um, a condom. <laughs> <laughs> well, that would make the public, the social media campaigns really rich. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you can work on what you can do with that. Um, I, just, I mean, I think just to put that in perspective, though, you know, in some sense, the, you know, the, the rate of global population growth, the rate of growth actually peaked in 1962. So the rate of growth has been coming down, right? And as we, we're still adding about 70 million people a year, so we're, you know, we're, we're coming from a, from a large base, but you know, as, we've, as we've understood that as we educate women, provide economic opportunity for women, birth rates do come down, and as that has spread with the access to contraception, I think we, that's actually a, a success story in a lot of countries. So absolutely, we're dealing with a legacy of, of a large base that's though growing at a smaller rate is still adding 70 million. But the piece we can actually do more about is, as developed countries is the consumption side. So I think making sure we have political leaders who support access to family planning universally I think is extremely important. Um, and yet really where we can have the most influence is on that consumption side. And I really see those as two sides of the same coin. If we don't deal with the population side and the consumption side, we're probably not gonna get to this in a more sustainable place. But it's a good question, and it often is the elephant in the living room. Um, but I think we, we have seen a lot of progress there. If you look at countries like Bangladesh and, you know, and Brazil and some of the, the countries that had very high growth rates, we're still seeing high growth rates in a lot of the Islamic countries where there's cultural and religious norms against this. But, but we've made a lot of progress, I think. If I can comment, I, I do agree, but just some kind of insight on how water is used and how it is wasted. Um, certainly both sides of that coin you need to look at, but shockingly, when I started doing some of these projects in the desert in Arizona, my first instinct was, well surely everyone in Arizona is using water super efficiently because it's a desert, right? <laughs> and my colleagues from the Northwest that had come down and started partnerships and programs said, you wouldn't believe it. It's actually less efficient than what we see up in the Pacific Northwest. You know, these guys for 100 years, 120 years, just throw a dam in the river, take every drop, use 40% of the water, divert it out, and whatever goes back, goes back later. You know, in the, in the headwaters of the Colorado, diverting in some of those systems, 60% of the water out of those rivers to go to Denver to serve as outdoor landscaping in the summer months. And so I do not disagree at all, but the, the bright side or the silver lining to the water piece is we've been wasting it so significantly that the opportunities are just rich. So you think in a smarter way. So I think the challenge is, and, and, and Bob is talking about this, so what happens if we start using water in a smarter way and we, we achieve that urban efficiency? Here's the trick. Do we just facilitate more development with that? Is that what we're gonna use that saved water for? Or are we gonna bank it and we're gonna start balancing it? And so I think that's where the crux is. I'm very confident that society has the tools and ability to significantly reduce water use. What I'm concerned about is, what are our policies and our leaders gonna do with that water that becomes available? Are we gonna do what we did at the turn of the century? Or are we gonna use it in a much smarter way looking forward? Awesome, so with that closing remark, ooh. Last comment, and then we're gonna then we're gonna get a quick seventh inning stretch uh, while we transition our panel, and then we're plowing on down so we can get to, get to lunch on time. Yeah. It's just a quick question for Bob. I see on your chart you you mentioned that agricultural water in California is eighty percent. Um, but agricultural water use efficiency is a very small up there compared to the urban water use. So I was wondering if you could just explain that a little bit. Mm -hmm. Very astute observation. <laughs> <laughs> that in my uh, life terminology would be a political number. Right? That is that there uh, is clearly much, much more potential um, to get additional water resources through efficiency in all sectors, especially in agriculture. We're going to see a lot more discussion on that, I think, this spring. With so I think it's all of the above. I will say, though, that part of this game is pointing fingers. Oh, they use a lot, so why worry about us in the cities? If we can cost-effectively improve water use efficiency in cities, why not? It makes sense, even if it's a smaller percentage. So it's a both hand in my view. We ought to do, you know, do both. The other nice number that's up there is the Mountain Meadow Restoration, which is one of the largest we're working on getting in. Uh, which is doing environmental restoration projects. Uh, I think Coca-Cola has been involved in one in uh, the colony. I've been involved in, in some in the upper feather watershed. It's very exciting work. And that's starting to get on the radar. So that's the good news on that part. But that was a good catch. Awesome. 
Great. Well, with that, I want to thank everyone and Christian, thank you from uh, from afar for helping give us this great dialogue about water and what we can do as.